Welcome to Reconnecting Brooklyn's History, Brooklyn's home front during World War II. Ugh, my apologies, of course. Again, welcome to Reconnecting Brooklyn's History, Brooklyn's home front during World War II. My name is Shirley brown Eileen, and I'm the manager of education for the Center for Brooklyn's History. The Brooklyn Public Library Center for Brooklyn History stands on land that is part of the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware people. As a sign of respect, we recognize and honor the Lenape Delaware nations, their elders past and present and future generations. For the agenda today, again, my name is Shirley Brown Aline, and I'm welcome, doing the welcome and overview. Next, approximately at 4.05, Brooklyn's home front during World War II. Our speaker tonight is Andrew Gustafson, Vice President, Turnstile Tours and Studio. And he's also a historical researcher, geographer, and cartographer. Then approximately 4.40, we'll have Q&A. And then about 4.55, we'll do wrap-up surveys and CTLE credit. CTLE credit. At the end of today's workshop, we'll share a survey link for everyone, educators, students, and others to complete. And please share your feedback on today's events as we are looking to see how we can best improve. If you are a teacher and would like CTLE credit, you must fill out this survey to receive the credit. Virtual housekeeping. Please utilize the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen for today's presentation. We will be compiling all questions using the Q&A feature. And at the end of the presentation, I will begin reading out the questions. Accessibility. If you need the closed caption, please feel free to click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. And if you have any trouble, please write something in the chat and one of the staff members will assist you or if you require other accommod accessibility accommodations, please email, email us at cbheducation at eklynlibrary.org. This session is being recorded. After the session is over, it will be uploaded online along with the booklets in our education resource page and you'll be and teachers will be able to use this for classroom or anyone will be able to see it again. Code of conduct. Please actively listen. Be sensitive to everyone else that is here and show your support. Attendees who violate this code of conduct will be removed from the webinar. The Center for Brooklyn's History is a, com is a combination of the Brooklyn Historical Society and the Brooklyn Public Library. We merged in 2000. Um, 21 to create the Center for Brooklyn's History. Please join us on May 4th when, off, when the author of Don't Know Much About History, Kenneth C. Davis, discusses immigration. So ladies and gentlemen, now I'd like to present to you um, Andrew Gustafson. Hi, Shirley. Thanks so much. Um, just gonna pull down your screen. Um, great, welcome everybody. Um, thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm so happy to be a uh, part of this wonderful series and worked for many years alongside Shirley and Charlie and, and the whole team at the Center for Brooklyn History and the Brooklyn Public Library and previously at the Brooklyn Historical Society. So um, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, I'm gonna pull up my slides here and we'll start our talk, which is titled, um, Brooklyn's home front during World War II. We're gonna try and cover a lot of ground, um, both physically and thematically over a relatively short period of time um, today. Uh, and please, I encourage you to ask questions. We really want um, this talk to um, 
equip you with the resources to uncover more of Brooklyn's World War II history in the communities where you are. Um, and so we're gonna talk about different sites uh, and neighborhoods all around the borough. Um, a little bit um, about what I do and our team at Turnstile does. I recognize a lot of names on here who have visited us at the Brooklyn Navy Yard or the Brooklyn Army Terminal or visit us virtually and participate in our programs. But um, what we do is we operate um, guided tours in partnership with nonprofit organizations. And our tours are really built around uh, rigorous original research um, and community engagement. Um, and we really try and tell stories that are underrepresented elsewhere in the public record. Um, we also work alongside cultural organizations to really help them build capacity um, to welcome the public. Um, and so we really focus on uh, highly site specific experiences that are built around, again, uh, primary sources, oral histories, multi-sensory engagement, and really everything that we do is about bringing the past to life and building these past present connections um, for people. Um, so they can better understand the communities in which they live and work here in New York City. Um, World War II history has been a big part of our um, programming for a long time. So we run the tours, uh, as I mentioned, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. We've um, been working there since 2008. Um, and we also run the tour programs of the Brooklyn Army Terminal, um, which we've done since 2012. And uh, I've been spearheading the research on the World War II related uh, programming that we do at, at both of those sites. Um, but we also work with the New York City Public Markets which have their origins in the Great Depression and World War II. Uh, and we work with a number of other waterfront um, industrial and cultural sites um, as well. We're gonna try and expand beyond just talking about the Navy Yard and the Army Terminal, um, but share really a, a broader perspective uh, on the, the role um, of different historic sites uh, in World War II in today's talk. So let's put things in perspective a little bit. Um, here you can see our agenda, oh, sorry, on the left-hand side. So I wanna give you a little bit of background about, the world, about World War II in Brooklyn. Then we're gonna look at the military landscape of the borough, uh, then look at the waterfront. We're gonna look at industry um, and we're gonna look at housing. Um, but you know, I don't need to remind people that World War II um, was a major global conf conflagration that still shapes our world today and we're not gonna cover all of it. Um, but our aim is to really highlight what were the local impacts of the war and the lasting legacy, um, especially new forms of uh, economic and social organization, things like ha transportation, housing, our food system um, that really emerged uh, from this period of time. Um, and really an important story of the war that's often overlooked is that World War II was a conflict about industry and logistics, um, and that was, really key to um, the America and the Allies' victory um, in, in the war, um, as not just military resources, but civilian resources were mobilized really on unprecedented scales. Um, and of course, we cannot forget all the lives um, that were lost um, and upended as a result uh, of the war, and that the vast majority of the people who were killed in the war were, um, were civilians. So let's look a little bit at the global impact. So World War II, um, during, in 1940, the world population was about 2.3 billion people. Um, there were 48 declared belligerent states um, and 690 million people served in the militaries um, of, of these belligerent states. Um, fighting took place on six continents and four oceans. 70 million people were killed. Seven in 10 were civilians. Four in 10 were citizens of the USSR. Three in 10 were citizens of China. Uh, and one in 12 um, were Jews. Um, and as a result, 60 million people were displaced um, at the end of the war. Um, in the United States, um, 16 million men and women served in uniform um, and over 400,000 uh, Americans were killed. Most of them were members of the military, but we'll also talk about some of the American civilians that were killed. Most of them uh, were actually merchant mariners, um, which we'll talk about. And we had about 670,000 people who were wounded um, in combat. Um, World War II really transformed the American economy. Um, it's estimated that 50% of the industrial production of the entire country went directly into the war effort. Um, and 66 million people were in, the U, uh, were in the U.S. workforce. Again, most of them working in some kind of war-related industry and, and nearly a third of them were women. So that's another topic we're gonna talk about was the expansion um, of the uh, workforce. 85,000 people actually died in um, industrial accidents. Uh, and 
100,000 people, it's estimated, uh, lost limbs as a result of industrial accidents here in the United States. Um, and roughly 6 million industrial workers suffered a major injury. One of the most dangerous jobs you could have back then and still you can have today is, is working in a shipyard. Um, and so it's estimated that more than one in 10 of those war industry workers who were killed um, were actually shipyard workers. Um, what did Brooklyn look like? So about 326,000 Brooklynites were in uniform um, and over 11,000 um, were killed. Um, we had 200,000 workers employed directly in wartime industries. And one of the focuses of the talk today is we're gonna look at some of those 800 factories and 20 shipyards just here in the borough of Brooklyn that were engaged um, in some kind of wartime production. It's estimated that about 15,000 ships were built or repaired in Brooklyn shipyards. The vast majority of those would fall under the category of repaired. Um, and over 1 million soldiers were embarked from Brooklyn piers and sent overseas. Um, and so we will definitely talk about that um, as well. Um, Brooklyn really sort of punched above its weight as well in terms of its contribution to the war effort. Obviously, it was a very, very you know, large borough um, in and of itself, um, but really it made an outsized contribution in large part because of its waterfront, but also because of its industry. You know, 6% of companies received what were called E or M military efficiency awards, and that was about double um, the national average. So these are some of the sites that we're going to um, take a, a brief look at um, in the talk today. Um, so obviously the Brooklyn Navy Yard um, and the Brooklyn Army Terminal, um, but you know I think especially the Navy Yard to a lesser extent the Army Terminal really sort of dominate the conversation when we talk about the historic sites um, of, um, of New York City during World War II. But there was so much happening in so many other places and oftentimes many important contributions to the war effort are often grafted incorrectly onto these other, onto these two major sites. Um, and so we wanna make sure that every neighborhood and every historic site you know, gets its proper due for its contributions to the war effort. So we'll talk a little bit about the Bush Terminal. Uh, we'll mention some lesser known sites or ones that are almost completely erased from the map. These include the Navy Armed Guard Center, uh, which is in Sunset Park, the Merchant Marine Training Center in Manhattan Beach. Um, the Shirley Chisholm Office Building downtown actually has an interesting wartime history. Um, the Todd Shipyard site, where now we have the IKEA parking lot. Um, Mergenthaler Linotype in Clinton Hill and other factories like Sperry, Rockwood. Um, and then important, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the impact that the war had on housing um, as well. Um, and then we'll also take a look at some of the memorials. Um, obviously, Brooklyn has a large memorial um, downtown on Cadman Plaza, but there are smaller memorials that folks may not be aware of um, that we'll also, we'll also mention. So we'll try and get through all of this in the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes, um, but please uh, keep your questions coming in the, in the Q&A if, uh, if I miss any of these and you're particularly interested in them. So I wanna talk a little bit about some resources for doing your own investigation or digging deeper on some of the things we're gonna talk about today. Um, Whenever I am looking at a particular site in its World War II history, this is often the resource that I turn to first. Um, and this is a supplement to the Brooklyn Daily Eagle that was published in December, 1945. Um, and he says, uh, Brooklyn the firstest and the mostest. Uh, and this is an amazing, amazing document um, that was a really comprehensive view um, of Brooklyn's role. Obviously there's, several pages on the Navy Yard. There's a couple pages on the Army Terminal, um, but then there are literally hundreds and hundreds of other sites that are listed in here. Um, everything from small factories employing a couple dozen people to, to huge industrial enterprises. Um, so there's literally hundreds of addresses of locations in here that you could probably find in, in your neighborhood if you're looking for you know, something uh, nearby your school, um, or if you wanna highlight a particular street or a block as part of a project, there's a good chance that you can find something um, in this here. So this is usually where I start and we'll look at some resources um, throughout the talk that are drawn from here um, as well. Um, but I love to start with a map uh, and just to highlight you know, the, the distribution of, of some of these facilities um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the borough and around New York Harbor. It's hard to just talk about the east side of the harbor without also talking about our neighbors to the north and west uh, in Manhattan and New Jersey and Staten Island. Um, but this comes from a 1944 map of the New York Port of Embarkation. And one thing I want to highlight is 
um, you know, New York really was, up until relatively recent memory, um, a pretty substantial military town. Um, at the outbreak of World War II, we had a number of major military facilities that were here, um, including the Navy Yard, obviously, the Army Terminal, but also um, Fort Hamilton, you know, Fort Jay uh, on Governor's Island. You had the Naval Fleet Supply Base, uh, which was in Sunset Park. That building is still standing as well. So um, it was a not insubstantial sort of garrison town um, already um, at the outbreak of the war, and that would expand uh, significantly um, once the U.S. formally entered the war. These facilities in Brooklyn also interacted with um, many facilities scattered around the harbor. So taking the example of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, it was one of, of you know, not just the 20 other shipyards we had in Brooklyn, but more than 40 um, that were scattered around the harbor um, across all the boroughs and in, in New Jersey as well. And the Brooklyn Army Terminal, um, while significant as the headquarters for all of the military transportation operations in New York Harbor, um, was just one of many other facilities that also shipped um, sailors and soldiers overseas. Um, so you can see those are marked um, in the darker color here. You can see the Staten Island Terminal here. You can see Port Johnston and, and Bay in Bayonne, New Jersey, Cave and Point in Jersey City, uh, Fort Hamilton, Bush Terminal. These were all part of the New York Port of Embarkation. Um, so this was a department of the military, the army specifically, um, that was charged with uh, moving uh, men and supplies uh, around the world. Um, so all of these different facilities were, uh, were interlinked in various ways that we'll talk about. Um, again, so we don't wanna just talk about the Brooklyn Navy Yard, but we're gonna talk about several examples um, from the yard, um, specifically because it was the largest military facility um, and and factory of any kind in Brooklyn or New York City or in New York State, in fact. Um, so it was arguably the largest shipyard in the world. Um, it's also very well documented, as we'll talk about. We have a wonderful collection of oral histories that have been collected over the last uh, 30 years or so. Um, that we have a, a much deeper understanding of the history of this place than, than some of the other less well documented places. But I don't want it to uh, dominate the conversation. Um, again, same thing with the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Army Terminal. Um, it was critical as a storage warehouse, as a headquarters facility, um, as a major um, port facility, um, but it wasn't the only one. Um, and so we don't want sort of these two sites to kind of subsume all of the Navy history and all of the Army history of World War II. Um, we'll talk about some of the smaller sites as well. Again, like the Sheepshead Bay Merchant Marine Training Center, um, an important major center of activity um, in Brooklyn um, was the neighborhood of Manhattan Beach. Um, and so there you had both the um, Merchant Marine Training Center um, right around the corner, and then you also had the Coast Guard Training Center there as well. You know, the Merchant Marine is often the overlooked part um, of the American um, World War II story. Um, because merchant mariners were absolutely critical to the American war effort. Because again, we talked about how this is a war of logistics. Uh, and so many of those civilian mariners who were um, sailing um, cargo ships, troop ships um, into the really dangerous waters, especially of the Atlantic, um, got their training uh, here in Brooklyn. And so the waterfront um, is really sort of the, the centerpiece um, of this, this entire talk. Um, because the waterfront was already mobilized um, prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor and prior to America's formal entry into the war. The waterfront was America's gateway um, to the world and Brooklyn's gateway to the world. And so uh, because this already was the busiest port in the world, um, it was quickly mobilized even before the war effort for, before the uh, official entrance into the war for things like the Lend-Lease program. Um, and the American Merchant Marine would be sort of sho shoved into the war zone um, before the Navy could really catch up and provide them with proper protection um, in the form of, of convoys and escorts. Um, and so these were the men who were some of the first actually um, in the direct line of fire um, during the war. Um, another important site and an overlooked um, group of individuals um, was the Navy Armed Guard, um, who also joined the war effort very early on. So, you know, America 
um, had a problem in the early days of the war um, in that uh, America's coastline especially was completely unprotected. Um, and in January of 1942, uh, Germany began um, a submarine campaign with just a small handful of submarines. They were able to wreak havoc uh, uh, with American coastal shipping up and down um, the Atlantic coast um, because there simply were not enough uh, Navy ships to help protect um, those. Um, most of them were being sent to guard troop ships that were going across the Atlantic. But ships that were going, say, between New York and Galveston, Texas, uh, were completely unprotected. Um, and so that's where they started, those German U-boats started to wreak havoc. Um, in response to this, what the American government started doing was arming merchant ships. And so putting guns on them, like you can see here, this gun tub in this illustration, um, they started putting um, guns on merchant ships. And these were actually manned by Navy sailors. So these were US Navy sailors who were serving on otherwise civilian crewed um, merchant ships. Um, and so this was called the Armed Guard and the largest armed guard center in the United States uh, was actually on 51st Street uh, and 1st Avenue um, in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Um, the building is no longer there, um, but we have this flagpole and a small memorial. I actually think this plaque has not survived actually. Um, but on the site of the former Armed Guard Center, there is now a large um, Department of Sanitation garage. Um, so we're trying to get this um, monument moved out of the um, out of the sanitation garage parking lot and into a more uh, accessible area and get it restored um, because it's a really important part of um, our local history but also part of World War II history and so we had the opportunity several years ago to interview the gentleman here um, in the center um, whose name is uh, John Custodio um, and he actually served in the Brooklyn Armed Guard Center. I, I want to play a little bit of his oral history um, describing what it was like um, going across the Atlantic um, into these submarine infested waters. Yeah, I made five trips across and somebody said, well, do you see any action? And I tell them, you cannot go in, in the Atlantic Ocean or the Mediterranean without seeing action. You either see the submarines or you see the uh, German planes. My first trip over was January, New Year's Day, 1943. We were pulling into Oran and one ship that was to the, the port side, the left of us, pulled in in front of us and blew up. It took two torpedoes. German, uh, we thought it was German torpedoes, but somebody said it was from an Italian sub, so we don't know. At that particular time, the Italians were fighting with the Germans. And then probably a year later, the Italians surrendered. But meanwhile, they were still fighting in the Mediterranean. Right. Uh, March of 1943, uh, somewhere near the Azores, we had uh, three or four uh, three or four days. We had nine ships sunk. So all of those journeys um, for John began and, and ended um, at this at this Navy Armed Guard Center. Um, so again, a forgotten little corner of history for a, a forgotten service um, in the U.S. Navy during World War II. Um, and you know the waterfront again was was mobilized um, for moving supplies, and most of the people that were doing this loading and unloading these ships were actually um, civilian workers. Here you can see these photos and the Brooklyn Army Terminal um, there in the distance, loading airplanes and loading trucks. And and this began in earnest in uh, 1940 um, and 41 prior to Pearl Harbor with Lend Lease and other programs um, sending this equipment um, out to uh, what would be the future allies. And again. The Brooklyn waterfront was really the gateway to the world. Uh, here we can see this is on an ammunition pier, uh, and you can see it's written no smoking uh, in 15 different languages. Um, so on here you can see it's written in, uh, in Russian, in Spanish, in French. Uh, it's written on here in Greek. Uh, 
in Croatian, uh, and I can't remember all of the language that, that are written here. Um, but again, this was the, the, the waterfront um, was, you know, Brooklyn's gateway to the world. Um, and the people that worked on the docks and especially worked on the ships um, were coming from all around the world, especially though a lot of them were coming from Norway. Um, and this is another important site and, and a, a little known um, piece of history. Um, but Norway um, was key to um, the Allied victory in World War II, again, because of logistics. And they had the fourth largest merchant marine in the world in terms of the sheer number of ships uh, flagged and owned in Norway. And when Norway was conquered um, by Nazi Germany, uh, the government ordered all ships to leave and go to neutral ports so they could preserve the Norwegian merchant marine and keep it out of German hands. Many of them wound up in New York um, and they actually organized their own shipping company uh, in exile. Uh, to run them. And they also created a school um, for training uh, sailors. And this school, you can see an article here from 1942, um, was actually located in uh, what used to be the, at the time it was the YMCA, and now it's the Shirley Chisholm uh, State Office Building at uh, 55 Hanson Place in downtown Brooklyn. So let's talk a little bit about um, manufacturing. Um, so here we have a quote uh, from Franklin Roosevelt's famous um, December 29, 1940 speech, The Arsenal of Democracy, uh, where he says, American industrial genius unmatched throughout all the world and the solution of production problems has been called upon to bring its resources and its talents to action. Manufacturers of watches, of farm equipment, uh, farm implements, of linotypes and cash registers and automobiles and sewing machines and lawnmowers and locomotives are now making fuses and bomb packing crates and telescope mounts and shells and pistols and tanks. And we're going to see examples of how uh, Brooklyn's um, civilian industry shifted over to wartime production for a lot of the things that are mentioned here. So let's look at a few specific examples. So linotype. Uh, linotype machines um, were actually manufactured in large part here in Brooklyn by a company um, called the Mergenthaler Linotype Company, which was located in Clinton Hill, actually directly south across Flushing Avenue from the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and some of their machines actually survive um, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. There's a company that still uses them called Woodside Press. Um, but there was not a huge need for these typesetting machines. Linotype machines were the first um, successful uh, automated typesetting machines um, when they're invented in the late 19th century. They have a lot of very, very complex uh, and precision machine parts. And so they had a lot of uh, precision machinery and a very skilled workforce. So they shifted over to making other things, um, including making um, uh, things like telescopes um, and other sighting equipment for artillery pieces. Uh, they made a lot of uh, really high quality lenses there as well. Here you can see this article from 1943. And a lot of the articles we're mentioning here, you can find on the um, uh, Brooklyn Newsstand um, website, which you can access through the Brooklyn Public Library, um, but about how uh, critical uh, equipment for artillery pieces um, was delivered to North Africa for um, Operation Torch in November, 1942, the allied invasion of, of North Africa. Um, so the, this equipment was going directly from the factory um, to the front lines. And here you can see uh, a worker inspecting. Um, this is a scope for a rifle. Food. Um, food has always been a big part of the manufacturing uh, ecosystem of New York City and of Brooklyn. And still today, it's the largest manufacturing sector. Um, and many of these companies um, during World War II were making things instead of chocolate bars, they were making rations. Um, this is Rockwood Chocolate, which was located on Park Avenue and Washington um, in um, Clinton Hill. Uh, they were one of the largest chocolate manufacturers in the country. Um, and instead um, of making their chocolate candies, they made um, these D rations, uh, which the military instructed them to make tastes slightly better than a boiled potato. Um, so they were not particularly tasty, um, but they were very high energy, uh, high calorie, high protein, and they could survive 
up to 140 degrees, which was important for forces fighting in places like the deserts of North Africa and the jungles of the South Pacific. Um, so they were meant to be melt proof. And here you can see an advertisement uh, for Rockwood um, from the war period where they're touting uh, their contribution to the war effort um, with these D rations. This building, uh, which is on Flatbush Avenue extension, you can see um, was the home of a really important um, company during the war and after the war and is still around today, though not in Brooklyn, and that is Sperry Gyroscope. Um, Sperry basically made all of the navigational equipment that was used by uh, airplanes and um, uh, and ships, um, but they also made a bomb site. Um, this was superseded um, by a competitor also manufactured in New York City, which was the Norden bomb site um, that was used primarily um, by American um, strategic bombers in, in World War II. Um, but again, high precision, um, high skill manufacturing uh, right here in downtown Brooklyn. One thing that happened during the war, however, um, was that new modes of manufacturing started to take shape. Um, namely, businesses started to move away from buildings like you see here on the right, vertically oriented manufacturing, where you have these large reinforced concrete or brick buildings and your assembly line was sort of scattered over uh, multiple floors. Um, instead, company, large companies um, like the Ford Motor Company um, started to pioneer um, single floor manufacturing where you have high ceilings, um, spread out over a large area so you could have one continuous assembly line. Um, and also you could store more things and you could pull things off of higher shelves thanks to the invention of forklifts, which were invented only in the late 1930s. Um, it's really hard to build a building like that in downtown Brooklyn or in Manhattan. Um, and so companies like Sperry, even during the war, started um, a process that would take them out of the city um, that would continue even after the war effort. Um, and so Sperry, by the end of World War II, isn't even in Brooklyn anymore. Their primary manufacturing is in Nassau County. Um, and so this is also the time in the post-war period where you see the suburban boom, and then we see the construction of the interstate highway system. Um, and so that really starts to draw workers away from the central city and, and leads to suburbanization and the depopulation and deindustrialization um, of places like Brooklyn. So during World War II, you know, we saw the high watermark really of manufacturing in Brooklyn, um, but we already start to see the seeds being sown um, for its decline um, that would really accelerate in the 1950s and 60s. And here we can see some examples of, you know, Sperry's larger scale um, factory that was so large that you know you got around it by using an industrial tricycle as you can see in the image on the right and obviously these images also show a, a big change that happened with a lot of industry during world war ii uh, which was women um, joining the workforce in large numbers this had also happened in world war one um, but um, accelerated um, and was done on a larger scale um, in in world war ii and, and more different types of professions were opened up to women in the second world war that hadn't been uh, in the first. So um, a little bit about the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the yard really hit its, um, you know, its peak in production um, during World War II and it also got the shape that it has today. The Navy Yard covers about 300 acres. Um, and so it had to expand greatly during World War II. And part of the way that it did that was by wiping something off the map, a really important Brooklyn landmark that was demolished in 1941. Um, and this is the wall of out market. Again, food was a major part of Brooklyn's economy. Uh, and so we had this massive wholesale food market um, located in Fort Greene um, on the footprint of where the Navy Yard is today, um, over 700 vendors um, that were evicted um, by eminent domain in the summer of 1941 and the entire market was demolished. Uh, and a smaller replacement market was built in um, Canarsie, which is still around today, but most of the functions of this market you would find uh, in the much, much larger food distribution center um, up in Hunts Point in the Bronx. <clears throat> and so again, here you can see the shape of the yard. It increased in size by about 50%. Um, you had um, you know, more than a dozen new buildings that were constructed. Um, and the workforce went from about 25,000 just before the war up to over 70,000. Uh, in World War II. 
um, at its peak in, in late 1944. And on any given day um, during the war, you would see uh, about 100 ships sitting here in the harbor uh, in this little Wallabout Bay right here. So incredible amount of activity. We only built about 16 ships during World War II um, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, but repaired more than 5,000. Um, and then add to that, you know, more than 10,000 ships um, repaired uh, at the 20 other shipyards um, across Brooklyn as well. So um, this was a huge, huge part of the city's economy. And, you know, roughly a third of all the, um, all of the shipyard workers um, in Brooklyn um, just work, uh, excuse me, roughly a third of all of the manufacturing workers in Brooklyn uh, worked in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and of course, of that workforce of about 70,000, about 10,000 of them were women. So about 5,000 women production workers, um, like you see Dorothy Lee and Anna Rojak here actually um, working as, as ship fitters, as welders, as cutters, actually building and repairing ships. And then about 5,000 women working in other positions like uh, drafting plans, working in clerical positions and support roles um, at the Navy Yard many of which had had those jobs before the war, but production workers uh, was something that was new. Um, and so here you can see, you know, the workforce um, across the country um, of, of shipyard workers, it's about uh, 970,000 people. Um, so, you know, roughly one in 10 of those is actually in Brooklyn. Um, even though we had a huge shipyard you know, facilities on the West Coast and all up and down the East Coast as well. Brooklyn was, was a really, really important center, center of it. Um, and the Brooklyn Navy Yard and other wartime industries um, started to open up more opportunities for people who had historically been excluded, um, men, um, African-Americans. Um, and so I wanna play for you a, a, another oral history clip. Um, and I wanna make sure we have enough time for questions. Um, but this is one of my favorite. This is a gentleman named Clarence Irving. And he's gonna describe um, you know, what it was like um, and what opportunities were created um, for, um, for working um, people like him uh, as a result of the war. My name is Clarence L. Irving Sr. If you take a look at the statistics of the 30s and 40s, best opportunity at that time for African Americans was to try and work for the federal government. In 1944, I got this call from the Navy, and they told me to report to the New York uh, Naval Shipyard. And he worked in the Navy Yard. They had all kind of uh, exhaust fans to take out smoke, to take out dust. To It was like working in paradise. And then on top of that, you had lockers. You could, because you could go in there with a white suit. And uh, change your suit, work in <laughs> grease up to your ears all day, go take a nice shower, put your white suit on, nobody knew where you worked. You couldn't do that in most factories. So they, and they had uh, uh, the most up-to-date equipment and uh, something was wrong. It was always a, a first aid person there. It was just a... Uh, an unbelievable place for people who had, uh, had worked on the, some of the terrible conditions. Uh, don't forget, you had terrible factories in New York City, awful fires and explosions. You didn't have that kind of thing in the Navy. And, and the Navy, I was beautiful. I mean, the sidewalks were like uh, Park Avenue. <laughs> um. So I hope that uh, after the program, you'll take the opportunity to listen to some of these oral histories um, that are gonna be included in the packet, but also on the Brooklyn uh, Public Library's website. Um, it's a really incredible resource. And, you know, Clarence really drives home some, some important points. You know, one being that um, while there certainly was discrimination in employment um, in, the, uh, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, you know, the federal, um, federal government, the federal bureaucracy, um, became a really important source of, of employment and really the backbone of, of the black middle class um, for a long, long time. And that really started during World War II. Um, and this would be the beginning of the Brooklyn Navy Yard became a major center of black employment. Um, it remained relatively low during World War II, but it would start to grow, especially as Brooklyn's black community began to grow. And by the time the Brooklyn Navy Yard closes in 1964, 
um, or they announced the closure in 1964, um, fully 20% of the workforce is, is um, Black, African American, and Caribbean. Um, so, you know, Clarence kind of alludes to that in that, that first clip. So I want to share that. Um, now, Brooklyn has, and the Navy Yard has a really important symbolic history to World War II that uh, I should absolutely mention. One is that built at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in 1916 was the USS Arizona. And this is the ship that was sunk at Pearl Harbor, you know, drawing the United States into World War II. And we do happen to have a piece uh, of the Arizona here in Brooklyn. This is at the Brooklyn Navy Yard Center at Building 92. I should mention, because um, I know many of you have probably brought classes to Building 92, um, the museum is not yet open um, to the public again, although we are taking people there on tours, uh, and we hope to be able to reopen uh, later this year. Um, but we do have a piece of the Arizona here in Brooklyn. Um, four, three years after it sunk, we build the USS Missouri, uh, and it was on the deck of the Missouri on September 2nd, 1945, where the instrument of surrender is signed, ending World War II. Um, and here you can see General Douglas MacArthur um, in Tokyo Bay aboard the USS Missouri. So really the two ships that formed the bookends of American involvement in World War II were both built here right in Brooklyn. So very significant symbolic importance for the yard and, and for the borough um, in the war. Um, a couple other things I want to mention, um, you know, again, some other sites, um, you know, you can find these factories and, and, and shipyards and places that make contributions to the war effort all over the map. Uh, the Todd Shipyard in Red Hook, like I mentioned, but even here, you go down to Brooklyn Bridge Park and there was significant work being done um, by Arthur Tickle Engineering. Here, they're actually rebuilding a barge that's gonna be used for the in invasion of Normandy um, in 1944. Um, so places that are little known for their, for their World War II history were having huge impacts all across the globe. Um, now, one thing is that we obviously need a lot of workers for all of these factories, all of these shipyards, um, and you know, for the military itself. And so people are pouring into New York City and it causes a major housing shortage. Now, New York City had begun a very ambitious uh, public housing program under Mayor LaGuardia um, in the years prior during the Great Depression. Um, and so we'd started to build up more housing stock, but there still was a significant shortage. And much of that housing stock that was meant to be you know, for low-income people sort of gets uh, waylaid um, and used for the military. Obviously the military helped pay for it, but as a result, um, for example, these are the Fort Greene houses, which we know today as the Ingersoll and the Walt Whitman houses. These actually became housing for the military and for civilian employees of the military and would remain uh, in, in federal hands um, until after the war. Um, and so, you know, this, this uh, so we have a housing shortage during the war with all these workers coming into the city. But then we also have one after the war as well, because you have all of these veterans returning home to New York City. Uh, and so we actually set up these Quonset hut encampments. Um, this was in Canarsie in 1946. Um, and some people had to live in here for months and years before they uh, were able to find a place to live and, and more housing that started to be built during the war started to come online. Places like Peter Cooper Village and, and Stuyvesant Town, but also places like the uh, Farragut Houses. Um, would help to relieve some of those, um, those major housing shortage issues. You can still find some of these Quonset huts that were from this Canarsie encampment. They've been moved to various parts of the borough. I know there's one on um, 2nd Avenue uh, or 3rd Avenue in Sunset Park. There's one on Knickerbocker Avenue in, in Bushwick. Um, so you can still find little pieces of this. And I've had the opportunity to meet people who grew up uh, in, these, uh, in these Quonset huts, um, remember living there uh, as kids. Uh, and here you can see a, a little reminder as well of the, the wallabout houses, um, again, just south of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, you have this in, insignia of an eagle because this was Navy housing actually well into the 1960s. Um, similarly, if anyone knows the Clinton Hill co-ops, you know, there are all these Navy insignias around the outside of them because that was also built for Navy housing, but is now, now private housing. Um, so you, you can find these little details around it that uncover a whole story um, about the major impacts of, of the war on our, on our built environment, um, but especially our, our housing system. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention before I turn it over to the questions, and you keep dropping your questions into the Q&A um, or into the chat, 
Um, but you know, we also have significant memorials. Um, the Brooklyn War Memorial in Cadman Plaza um, being the largest. Uh, this is a rendering of the future vision and redesign of it. Um, well, hopefully this will come back on track because the memorial has been closed now for more than 30 years because it is not uh, accessible. Um, it is not ADA compliant. Um, so they've closed it uh, rather than, than redesign it. Um, so hopefully, um, you know, this major piece of, uh, of our history right in the heart of Brooklyn uh, will be reactivated and, and will be uh, open to the public again. Um, but this is perhaps my favorite World War II memorial. This is to all of the transit authority workers uh, from New York City who were killed in the war. Um, this used to be right outside the J Street subway station. Um, now it's actually inside 130 Livingston Street. So if you step inside the MTA building there, uh, you can see it. Uh, it's it's um, visible to the public uh, hanging on the wall here. Um, so again, a little, little known monument about the important contribution um, and sacrifice of, of transit authority workers. Um, and then down in Sheepshead Bay, we have a, a Holocaust Memorial um, in, in Brooklyn, um, which sits right on the water here, the Holocaust uh, Memorial Park, um, which is really um, you know, incredibly moving. And of course, so many families have connections to the Holocaust. We're one of the largest survivor communities in the world um, is here in, in Brooklyn, and it's commemorated in, in, in many ways, but this is one of the public places that you can go and visit. Um, so that's where I'm, I'm gonna end here um, and turn it over to questions. Um, again, we really just scratched the surface um, today and, and hopefully it generated some ideas for, for you and, and maybe we mentioned some places in your own communities. Um, and we hope that you'll take advantage of, of a lot of the really wonderful resources um, that, the, um, that the Brooklyn Public Library has to offer. Um, oh, I did wanna mention one more thing. I'm just gonna pull my slides back up again, sorry. Um, feel free to contact me um, if you have any questions and then Charlie will also drop this info into the um, into the chat as well. Um, but feel free to email me. And then we also, you can go to our website and we have a number of articles, um, videos, uh, and other resources related to World War II history if, if you want to dig a little bit deeper. But that's where I'll that's where I'll end it. Um, yeah, so Shirley, do we have any have any questions? Yes, we do have some questions. First of all, thank you, Andrew. That yeah. was great. Um, I was curious about um, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And at the um, with the um, the civilian workforce, how was it for women when they had to, when they were literally asked to leave the kitchen and go into the workforce? Um, how how what was it? What was their working conditions like? And then after the war, how was was it was it was it an easy transition to go from workplace back to the kitchen? Sure. Um, this is this is something that changed um, during the course of the war. Um, you know. Women had experienced this during World War I, um, where lots of women entered wartime industries um, and then did it temporarily. And they were sort of circumscribed in the roles that they could have. A lot of women worked in uh, munitions plants, for example. Um, but during World War II, more opportunities were open for more traditionally male roles. Um, but still at the outbreak of the war, um, you know, I, there was a survey that was done. I wish I could remember the exact figures, but in, in 1942, um, there was a survey done of, of female workers, war workers across the, the country, um, and something like three quarters of them said, you know, after the war was over, they'd be happy to go back to their old lives and, and leave the industrial workforce. Um, when that same survey was done in 1945, it was something like two thirds of women want to keep their jobs. Um, so many women became accustomed to um, the freedom outside the home. Many of them were making more money than they had ever made before. It gave them a lot of independence. Unfortunately, if we take the example of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, all of the female industrial workers there were what were called unclassified employees, meaning they had a job for the duration of the war plus six months. So they were basically all let go. Um, so were most of the men. You know, the workforce fell off by about you know three quarters um, after the war ended. Um, but those men could then go down the street and get a job at another factory or another shipyard. 
and they could use the skills that they had gained in the war. Women were not given that opportunity. And we have a wonderful oral history, one that I'll highlight, which you can find in the collection, um, is with Ida Pollock and Sylvia Everett. And they talk specifically about trying to get jobs after the war and people basically just laughing in their faces. So although the war represented some major steps forward, for women, you saw this retrenchment um, after the war of those traditional gender roles and, and women were again, you know, excluded from, from working in those types of jobs. Another reason as well that this retrenchment happened is that women were competition for the 16 million men who had been in uniform who were coming back into the workforce. And frankly, the federal government had promised all of those men jobs. Uh, and so there simply weren't enough jobs to go around. And so they prioritized, um, you know, giving the jobs to veterans versus giving jobs to, um, you know, the experienced women after the war. Okay, another question we have is, is the Armed Guard Memorial the rusty flag pole that they see on Google Street View at the Department of Sanitation parking lot at 1st and 51st Street here in Brooklyn? Uh, yes, it is. Um, so that memorial was put up first in the 1980s. It was refurbished then about 15 years ago. Um, but uh, yeah, um, you know, the uh, Community Board 7, um, has been looking into it to try and, which is for the community board for Sunset Park in Windsor Terrace where I live. Um, and they've been looking into trying to get it uh, refurbished and moved um, into the adjacent, potentially into the adjacent um, Bush Terminal Park. Um, so it'll be more accessible and have a more appropriate uh, plaque um, with more information to really educate the public about uh, what that site was for. Um, there actually is a very nice plaque that shares the story of the armed guard. It just happens to be inside the office of the sanitation department. So it's not open to the public. So we're trying to, you know, make, elevate this story and, and make it more accessible to people. Um, but yeah, that, that's exactly where it is. Uh, you can walk down 51st street. It's, that's a public street, but um, you just got to dodge some garbage trucks to get there. So <laughs> sanitation department has been, you know, faithful stewards of it for a couple decades now, but it would be nice if it was more publicly accessible. Um, another person has written, thank you. Hi, and thank you for today's talk. I have a question about the rate of injury. In the first PowerPoint, you show the number of injuries, but do you have any resources of the rate of who is injured, like women, men, their ethnicities, amongst other things? Yeah, that's a good question. So there are a number of industrial reports um, about this. Um, I, I can't point you to a primary source right now, but a good book um, to check out, and I'm not recalling the author. Um, if you give me a minute, I will grab it, but um, it's called Divided Arsenal, um, and it is about um, segregation um, within the American military and workforce during World War II. Um, and so that book uh, is by uh, Daniel Kreider. It was it was written in, in the year two thousand. Um, so I know that that book makes reference to it. So that that's a good resource to turn to. Good. And then one last question. I know that Howard Zinn actually worked at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Can you tell us about this, especially during World War II? Can you tell us a little bit of information about what about how life was for him working at the Navy Yard during World War II? Yeah, I mean, Howard Zinn um, did an oral history. Um, I'm not sure if it's on the, the BPL uh, website. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, he, he talks about, I mean, a couple important things happened to him. Uh, one is, you know, he got very much involved in labor activism and, and the workers at the Brooklyn Navy Yard were reunionized. Uh, and there were some important moments of agitation, although during World War II, there was labor peace, essentially the, the big unions, um, to, you know, made it a, a handshake agreement with the federal government that they wouldn't strike uh, during the war. As a result of that, we have a huge pent up, you know, uh, frustration that results in the largest strike wave we've ever seen, literally starting in the fall of 1945. Like the minute the war ends, you see strikes break out across the country, including huge strikes here in New York City along the waterfront. Um, so, you know, Howard Zinn, um, you know, was very much involved in labor activism while he was at the yard. You know, he also witnessed a worker being killed. Um, and that, that had a huge impact on, on him. Um, and while Clarence Irving talks about how in comparison uh, to where he had worked before, the Navy Yard was extremely safe. You know, Howard Zinn um, had the opposite reaction. They thought it was an extremely, extremely dangerous and unsafe place to work. Um, so it's interesting people's 
people's uh, perspective and, and comparison that you see there. Uh, and obviously, you know, at, while he was working uh, in the yard, uh, Howard Zinn was, um, was drafted um, and served in the Army um, Bomber Corps. And of course, participating in the aerial bombing of, of, of Europe had a profound impact on him and his activism during his life. I'll add another thing, which is we did an oral history um, a couple of years ago with a guy named Saul Schechter, um, who happens to be Howard Zinn's brother-in-law. And he knew Howard Zinn way back then. And, and he talks in his oral history about, uh, you know, Howard and, you know, how proud he was of him and his activism. Also, you know, how they disagreed politically. Uh, but he talks about knowing personally and, and seeing um, firsthand the impact that working at the yard and his experience in the war had on, on him and his, his life after the war. Um, another, you know, interesting figure to, to uh, he didn't do an oral history, but he wrote a book where he talks about his time in the, uh, in the Navy Yard is um, Arthur Miller. Um, who also has a different perspective. He talks a lot about the war, or, or talks a lot about the Navy Yard being extremely, you know, inefficient, a lot of people laying around and getting drunk uh, and carousing in the yard. Um, so he talks about that in his memoir, Time Bends, as well. And then I, I just have to give a, since we're talking about sort of, uh, you know, literary yard, I have to give a, a big plug to Jennifer Egan and her wonderful book, Manhattan Beach. Uh, and one of the great things about that book is almost everything that happens in the novel in the Navy Yard that's not related to the plot, um, but just the day-to-day -day things that happen is all taken from oral histories, many of which Jennifer Egan herself collected. So she was really the catalyst for uh, restarting the oral history program back in 2007. Um, and you know that's when we started the tour program as well as part of an effort to try and capture um, the stories and experiences of, of people who lived through World War II while they were still with us. Um, and so during that time period from about 2007 through about, you know, 2014, 2015, we were able to collect a lot of oral histories. Unfortunately, um, there are few and fewer people who are able to interview from that time period, but we're continuing to collect oral histories uh, from later periods. We're getting more and more people who are at the yard in the 50s, 60s, and we're especially interested in collecting stories from the 1970s um, as well. Um, I just have to grab my charger here. My computer's about to die, but um, yeah. Um, any other questions, Shirley? Well, I Actually, Andrew, we're just about out of time, um, but thank you so much for participating with us today. Um, I do highly recommend Turnstile Tours. Their tours are fabulous of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, as well as of the Brooklyn Army Terminal. I definitely highly 